the way entrepreneurship is portrayed in the media should be thought about in a little bit different way. Most of those people didn't start revolutionary, new, groundbreaking ideas. They started really small, they were tinkering, they were playing around with their business and their ideas and different things. And eventually, they took a step up. A little quick episode. I am having fun in Athens, Georgia. It's Sunday morning, October 3rd. I went to the football game yesterday in Athens as the Georgia Bulldogs crushed a top 10 team, Arkansas, at home. Electric atmosphere, tons of fun. The wife and I went out that night afterwards. Um, but yeah, I'm here, I'm in the morning, it's, it's the morning. Saw some stuff on the internet that made me wanna give you in a rant. It's been a while since I've done a rant, actually. I've been trying really hard lately to be positive and you know, super you know, anti-negative, not gonna complain about people on the internet. But all I see, and maybe it's the people that I follow, maybe it's the, the fact that more and more of my friends are you know, technology entrepreneurs, many of them are venture capitalists, but all I see on entrepreneurship culture, media around entrepreneurship from the influencers in the space is tech startup this, tech startup that, new idea, put up a landing page and test your idea and then build your idea and all this new idea, frankly, bullshit. And I'm going to tell you right now that I think all you need to do to start a business and I'm not even gonna call it a startup because a startup sounds so new idea, revolutionary, game-changing, technology, all that. All you need to do to start a business is to get out there, sell somebody on a service or a product or whatever it is, sell somebody something and do some work for some people. Get out there and do some work for people. That's how you start a business. Build the business after making some money. I'm gonna say that again. Go out there and do some work for somebody personally. Trade your time for money. If you start making some money, build a business around that. Look up from your computer screen. Too many people are sitting here on their computer thinking about how they can make money on the internet. Geography, the fact that we have a physical world with a bunch of people in the physical world in different locations that need different things. Actually, they all need the same thing. They need a well-maintained house. They need cleaning services. They need their physical world to be clean and well-maintained or upgraded or improved or built or whatever it might be. There are inefficiencies all over this physical world. The biggest barrier to entry, the biggest moat in business is geography, is the fact that, okay, there may be a very good operator of a certain service or business in this town, but he might not be in my town. And guess what? He's not gonna ever be in my town. He can't go and operate all over the world on the internet. One company on the internet can operate anywhere. You're competing against a flat world. You're competing against people in the Philippines. You're competing against people in Silicon Valley. You're competing against Stanford grads. You're competing against brilliant engineers. You're competing against the entire world when you sell something on the internet. And I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm selling a lot of things on the internet now. But I'm telling you the good risk adjusted return, the better risk adjusted return, and not enough people think about entrepreneurship from a risk adjusted return perspective. A lot of people think about entrepreneurship as Big shot, big success. We read the books, we read Elon Musk's book, we read Steve Jobs' book, we read all these people who took giant shots, made it big, and made a ton of money. We don't hear about the 999 others out of every thousand that start a business that end up shutting it down and going to get jobs because they try to do a new revolutionary business idea and change the world on the internet. So I'm gonna tell you it again, new groundbreaking ideas Revolutionary entrepreneurship is what I call it. Revolutionary entrepreneurship is, it does not provide good risk adjusted returns for founders. It does not provide good risk adjusted returns. And what do I mean by risk adjusted returns? Okay, yeah, the, but the potential returns are great. If you start a tech unicorn and you make a billion dollars, the returns are great. But how much risk did you take to get there? What were the odds of your success? Every return, I could buy crypto today and it could double tomorrow, but it could also go to zero. Every return that you make has to be risk adjusted. If I have a risk-free return of five or 6%, that may be a hell of a lot better than a 50% return on a cryptocurrency that could go to zero on me. That's how risk adjusted returns work. I'm also gonna tell you that the blue ocean strategy that we read about is creating an, a monopoly. Make it so that you're not competing against anybody, that you have an entire market to yourself. Create a blue ocean. That is all such bullshit. I'm gonna tell you right now, find a market. I'm looking at some notes over here if you see me moving away, if you're watching the video on YouTube. 
Find a market where you can carve out a piece of an existing pie. There's a business already happening. There is customers, there's companies. You can study it, you can study the market, you can figure out how and when and where you are going to carve out your piece and add value. Find an existing market that is not a blue ocean where you can carve out a piece of the pie and make some money. All you need is a piece of the pie. You need a little bit of an existing market. That's it. So many, so many people start way too big. Oh, I need everything. I need a blue ocean. I need a, a monopoly. That's what they think. And I'll tell you also that most entrepreneurs over-innovate. I've sat on boards, I've sat on panels where you judge college entrepreneurship competitions. And I know that's not real entrepreneurship. It's a lot of people being creative. It's a good exercise. I'm, I'm a fan of college entrepreneurship culture. But I've sat on so many of these panels where we judge an entrepreneurship pitch competition. And I just wanted to stand up and scream the whole time. I wanted to stand up and scream, simplify it. You have a little opportunity over here, not doing a whole lot different. If you just do this one little thing different, you can make a lot of money, but they're gonna do totally new way of thinking about X, Y, and Z. And before you know it, they have a totally new business. It's a revolutionary idea that should take in the next moonshot. Entrepreneurs who succeed, they look out there at existing businesses and find just a little bitty small way to innovate. Maybe they actually copy other businesses. Maybe they look and say, oh, there's seven companies in my town that do what I'm thinking about doing. I'm gonna study them, I'm gonna look at how they interact with customers, I'm gonna get on their website, I'm gonna call their customer service team, I'm gonna think about how they do business, and then I'm gonna take the bits and pieces from the best ones and I'm gonna build a business that's better than any of them. But nothing's revolutionary, not a single new thing, it's just small, incremental innovation. We did that in our business, it was student storage, pick up and delivery student storage. When we started our business, there was a company at our school already doing it that did 1,500 students a year, and made about 600 grand in revenue. There was a company at Cornell doing exactly what we were going to do, making $600,000 a year in revenue. They completely dominated the market, but guess what? We looked at how they were doing business, we studied them, we saw them carrying around scales and weighing boxes, and we're like, oh my God. We saw them carrying around clipboards, we saw that you couldn't sign up within three days. We knew students were procrastinators. We knew they were losing a lot of business. And we said, hey, if we just do a couple things a little differently, we can dominate this business. We can carve out a piece of the pie and we can do well. Same thing, in, we looked in some other markets. We looked at Indiana University. They had a really good company. It was called Guys and Dollies. They did a very good job. We copied a lot of what they did. Same with the three companies in Boston that were already doing what we were doing. Same with the other four companies in Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia and all these schools. There were 20 companies doing exactly what we wanted to do. All we did was make small incremental improvements and block and tackle and run a business and carve out our piece of the pie. And guess what? We had a multi-million dollar exit, sold that business, got our start in real estate and made a bunch of money. So you can be late to the party and you can still eat a lot of cake. You can be late to the game. You can start a business that's already out there. You can start a company that's already exists and you can eat a lot of cake. Another thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is competition. Who would you rather compete against? A bunch of guys who are in the YC Combinator, guys and gals, a bunch of folks who are Stanford grads, a bunch of brilliant computer engineers, a bunch of software engineers, or a bunch of Amazon sellers in China, big companies with big data, with big research budgets. Would you rather compete against them or would you rather compete against the guy down the street in your town who makes a lot of money but operates with a fax machine? You tell me, who would you rather compete with? The college grads, the brilliant grads, the Ivy Leaguers, or the people who have been making a lot of money for a long time and use a darn fax machine inside their business and they have a secretary in an office and blah, 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 blah. And the last thing I wanna tell you is that you should not get emotionally tied to your business. The more fun your business is, the more interested you are in it, the more awesome it is and it's, the more passionate you are about it, the more likely other people are passionate about it as well. And the more likely it's ultra competitive and the more likely it's really hard to make some money. If you do the ugly, dirty, sweaty things that nobody cares about, that nobody's passionate about, as an opportunity to add value to the world and build a business, then you will win. And guess what, guess what? Whatever you're deciding to do, whatever it is that you're going on and starting a business in, if you are running a business the right way, you're not gonna be doing it very long anyway. If you run a business the right way, two, three, four months in, all you're gonna be doing is selling, hiring, training, solving problems, and building processes. That's what you're gonna be doing inside your business. You're not gonna be tinkering or mowing lawns or you know, giving golf lessons or selling, you know, or trading crypto or whatever it might be. So I'm gonna tell you that getting emotionally tied to your business is a recipe for failure. You will be competing against people who don't make rational decisions about their money 
You'll be competing about with people who are hobbyists, and it's very dangerous and scary to believe to compete with people who don't make decisions based on economic factors. So I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna leave you with this, that the way entrepreneurship is portrayed in the media should be thought about in a little bit different way. The entrepreneurs that you know and see in your town, maybe they're at your country club, or maybe they come in to speak to your classes, or maybe they're just normal people next door to you that you don't even know how well they're doing. Most of those people didn't start revolutionary, new ground-breaking ideas. Most of them, started a business that was unsexy, not notable, not revolutionary. Maybe their friends didn't even consider them entrepreneurs because they didn't have a new idea, they'd never go on Shark Tank. But they found a way to carve out a piece of the pie, doing something that nobody else was willing to do well, or maybe there was other people out there doing it, but the competition was weak, the risk was low. They started small. They started really small, they were tinkering. They were playing around with their business and their ideas and different things, and eventually, they took a step up. They went from moving boxes to hiring people to move boxes, in my case. They went from doing a service at three or four schools to doing a service at 30 schools and having 150 part-time employees every year work with them and, and bring home a half million dollars a year for a couple years straight. And then they take that million dollars that they got in the bank and they go build a self-storage facility where they get into real estate, where they go big, and that's when they have some skill. They have a network. They have real ability. Maybe they're more mature, and that's when maybe they take an even bigger risk and do something different and harder and maybe even a little revolutionary. But I'm gonna leave you with the fact that most entrepreneurs, most wealthy entrepreneurs, most successful entrepreneurs did not start with no experience, no operational chops, and launch the next big unicorn that made them billionaires. This episode of The Sweaty Startup is brought to you by Launch Kits. Visit launchkits.com slash sweaty for $50 off a $750 website. So for $700, and they actually turn it around in seven days as well. So for $700, you get an SEO search engine optimized website. You get G Suite integration with email and Google My Business optimization, and you get a beautiful website. Visit boltstorage.com. That's my website. Justin and his team built it. They've built over 100 websites for folks who listen to this show. And guys, it's as good as it gets. If you need to get found online, visit launchkits.com slash sweaty today.